Well, welcome all to the Thursday Ag Tech Meetup. It's really great to have you here today. I'm Steve Mantle. Um, and as long as my cell coverage works fine under shade cloth in a blueberry and cherry uh, set of blocks, um, we'll be just fine today. Um, but I think some of you guys can relate to that. <laughs> um, so today we've got uh, Rob Tiffany with Erickson. I'll get into intros here in a minute. And Scott Waller and his thingy. I mean, Scott Waller with thingy IOT. Oh. Um, uh, rough, rough, rough crowd, rough crowd. <laughs> wow, thanks. <laughs> yeah, you betcha. But so today's pretty cash, guys. Uh, we don't actually have a whole lot of slides, although I thought we'd kick it off and talk a little bit about um, some of the uses for IoT in ag. Um, then we're, we'll swap to the, I think Scott's going first, and then... Um, then Rob, and then it's really open conversation. And um, I would strongly encourage you to think about kind of what, not softballs, what hardballs to throw at these guys. Um, make them squirm, um, I think, and, and then delight in every minute. It'll be fun. Um, but no, it's, it's informal, cash, and um, it's all about none of us are, are deep experts in anything. Ag is... is uh, a lot of moving parts and ag and tech. And so that's why it's a meetup. So um, let's jump right on in on, well, why IoT and ag? And the beautiful thing about this is this is the second time I've seen this slide today in, uh, and I'm kind of taking it in. I'm not going to read through this, but moral of the story is um, IoT really has the capability to help growers around cost optimization, around getting people to the right place in the right time, around um, uh, better, better understanding how and where you can optimize chem application rates and water application rates and getting to the right place when it comes to frost, um, which we'll talk about in a little bit. It's been a rough year in the Pacific Northwest for frost and some of the unpredictability. Um, but that ultimately, for some growers in particular, that comes down to microclimates and nanoclimates um, and increasingly depending on uh, in can canopy weather sensors uh, for temp and RH. Um, the stats that, that we've done with um, we research with WSU, are seeing anywhere from four to seven degrees Fahrenheit difference in canopy versus out of canopy. And um, that can make a huge difference when you start adding up cumulative numbers like growing degree days. Um, so let's take a look at the next slide. Um, so all sorts of fun IoT sensors out there. And again, we'd love you guys to jump in after um, Scott and, and Rob give their kind of intro bit um, on your perspectives on other sensors that you've seen out there. I mean, uh, of course, we all know and love um, weather stations. That's probably one of the, the grandfathers of them all when it comes to IoT sensors in, in ag. You see an ag weather net station there in the top left. I believe that is out at the Prescott Irrigation, Irrigated Ag Research Center. Um, uh, second one down, you see a soil moisture sensor um, that's being installed. Uh, third one down, you see a uh, drone uh, that's being driven out or flown out in one of the Smart Orchard locations last year that's got an array of, of sensors on it. Um, center section here, you see uh, good stuff. In fact, if I'm, if we're all really brave, I'll, I'll show you one here in action here, but a Green Atlas uh, ATV that's got um, cameras and LIDAR and on the front of it, um, soil sensors or spectrometers, I should say, um, yeah, GPS um, and, and so on. I'll kit it out. Top right, you see... Um, a, a smart sprayer that's got all sorts of uh, IoT sensors on it and the ability to control, uh, in this case, the solenoids on the back of each individual spray uh, sprayer. 
And then um, more of a variation on a theme there on the right, one of our new hires, Kayla, um, on the left-hand side, looking quite perplexed as to when is he going to stop talking um, as I'm standing in front of the, the uh, ATV. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, so spring blossom, man, it has been an interesting time of year. Why don't you go ahead and kick that off um, on the, the video there. Nicely done there, Ian. So this was out on Orchard uh, two and a half weeks ago, I believe. Um, cherry blossom, I believe we're looking at here. Um, and kind of fun times coming through um, with the herky-jerky zoom action. Um and zipping around um, under under shade cloth. Um, really, what we're seeing, you see the second one um, already in down in Walla Walla area. Um, cherries um, have already. Um, somebody correct me. I'm going to say it wrong. I think it's shuck split, um, but basically emerging already post blossom. It's kind of crazy. We just had uh, been out in blossoms last week and and already you're seeing um, the cherries and then bottom right of i'm seeing right here on my four inch screen um is one of our uh grower partners that's doing all hands on deck uh to water and try to save uh from frost uh just a week and a half ago um one of the growers um we talked to in the last couple of days um most of their cherry is entirely um, a write-off uh, due to extreme temps where they just could not get ahead of the frost and it was down to 22 degrees. Um, interestingly, not too far down the road, another grower um, actually had no losses at all. And part of it is that they're a much more heavily sensorized uh, orchard and it helped them get to the right place, right time. Again, you know, sensors aren't the savior. Savior, you can only do so much with with Mother Nature, but at least they help you um, get to right place at right time as best as you can. Um, so next slide, I think that's this is where I hand it off to the thingy guy, Scott. The floor <laughs> is yours. Hey, thanks, man. Um, you know, it's uh, it's uh, it's fun to uh, always work with you, even when. <laughs> Even when you laugh uh, excessively about uh, about the thingy name, but hey, that's why we do it, and that's why we're catchy, and that's why we uh, we work in this space. But so uh, I'm Scott Waller, um, uh, CEO and co-founder of Thingy. Um, my partner and I, he's down in Australia. He actually might be on this call. Andrew might be here, but uh, we started back in 2017 building the wildfire sensor while we're at Cisco, um, and uh, that's turned into a whole bunch of stuff. But what we've been focusing on really is uh, solving the communication problem, right? And we focused uh, primarily on LoRaWAN um, as a connectivity method for long range, low power, you know, really, really small, low cost sensors that can really in, in agriculture tell the story as, as we like to say. I think we, we coined that term last week, didn't we, Steve? But it's, uh, you know, what we're trying to do is figure out the right sensors. It's not about just throwing sensors out the field. It's right. It's gathering data, telling the story of what the crop is doing, what the weather is doing, like in a microclimate. Um, we have so many microclimates in these permanent specialized crops that, that really don't exist in commodity and row crops. And so how can we bring the right technology to, to really monitor and metric what's going on in the field to tell that story. So then we can create actions uh, based on that. So when you look at things like frost, you know, there, it's, it's amazing how folks will look for their frost control. They'll look at the local weather station. Um, so maybe if you're down in the Zilla Valley, the Yakima Valley, you're gonna look at Topanish as the site. Well, that's, you know, about seven miles away and about 500 feet in elevation below you. Um, are you gonna base your frost control methods based on your croc, based on that? data there versus more hyper local or nano loco um, uh, weather stations that we can deploy. So we're trying to connect those things as well, right? And we've, we've talked about this a lot over in uh, past webinars and that's around, um, uh, you know, connectivity is not guaranteed. LTE is not guaranteed everywhere. Uh, and it really depends on where you're at in the use case and, and to try to solve the connectivity problem. So we can get data and insights that actually create actions and applications on that. So you can go to the next slide, Ian. Uh, go ahead and skip this one. 
So, uh, it, you know, it's funny, uh, Steve and I, we cross paths a lot and we cross paths more and more lately, you know, whether it's back in the Microsoft days or ending up on a, an ag tech call with uh, WSU in a breakout room, I think it was last year to, you know, I texted him uh, a couple weeks ago and I said, hey, Steve, where are you at? I'm going to Missoula for some fire science testing. And uh, he goes, well, the funny thing is I just left Missoula. I'll meet you at uh, exit 70. And uh, so it's a, it's a small world, you know, Steve's driving around, you know, with ATVs everywhere and uh, I'm out installing LoRaWAN networks as many places as I can, putting smoke sensors out and, you know, it's a small world. And I think what, you know, Steve and I, when we first started working on some of these projects together is whether it's a smart orchard or we're really looking at how in the tech industry and in the ag tech industry specifically, you know, everyone has their own value and, and strengths. Um, if we do things in silos, we're never going to get anything done. Every farmer is going to have 52 apps on their phones. What can we do collaboratively, right? Steve, you know, those guys in, in Innovate Ag have done a great job on data sets and machine learning and, and, and vision. We're working on telemetry, low cost sensors, air quality. And then there are others in the connectivity space like the, the pocket and INAT guys or smaller WISPs that are out there providing connectivity with CBRS and private LTE. It's gonna take us all together working in the in the ag industry, I think, to solve these problems. So it's not, at all, not about just, you know, launching one product and vertical in the market. It's about, I think, collaborating. And I think one of the things that we do really, really well together um, is partner in the research side uh, because just creating a sensor and bringing it to market versus validating it, ground truthing it with the scientists, with the ag leaders. I think that's where we get really meaningful data and insights that we can action on versus just some nice shiny little product. So uh, next screen. So uh, people ask me about LoRaWAN all the time, right? First of all, what is, you know, we won't talk about it here because this is not a, a connectivity conversation. There's uh, there's other webinars that we talked about, but. One of them is like, what is long range for LoRaWAN? And people will talk about uh, in Europe, they've, you know, from, a, from a, a, a ground station to a satellite, they were getting 800 kilometers. But this is actually out in uh, the Yakima Valley. Um, I've been seeing consistently from, so on the right-hand side, there's a, a weather station from Barani. Um, and it is a LoRaWAN based weather station sitting on top of one of the poles in the Smart Orchard. I'm getting from about 24 miles away from that little antenna and gateway at the side of the pump house. Uh, I'm getting a really strong signal and we're getting, you know, small amounts of data. And what we're trying to do is, again, we're not trying to stream megabytes of data. These are bytes of data. We're getting really good connectivity. So, you know, this is what's possible. And as you can see on the map, we're starting to sprinkle gateways at different farms throughout the area that we can provide connectivity in the LP WAN space that is not tied necessarily to a carrier, but it's something that we're creating and it's open that uh, we can provide connectivity for, for other farms and other uses and really also sharing it with researchers. So uh, next slide. So these are some of the weather stations we put out uh, last week actually at uh, the Smart Orchard out in um, uh, Grandview. Uh, we got a, just an anemometer that is, it's all solar powered, a small little, uh, compute unit that has a LoRaWAN radio in it on the on the left hand side there in the middle is a uh, a rain bucket and a uh, temperature weather humidity station it's got a solar panel on top runs indefinitely transmits high grade weather station data every 15 minutes and these things are about 500 bucks so um, and the great part is is uh, unlike traditional weather stations um, it's not tied to a data logger there's no wires you can decouple where you put your anemometer to your rain bucket to your temp weather humidity station. So um, it just allows us to disaggregate. I like the term of disaggregating these because then you can put them in the right place in the right time versus always being tied to a data logger. We've got some soil moisture sensors and then on the far right, we've got some, uh, some pulse counters that we've been doing. Next slide, Ian. And then uh, a, couple, a couple of quick little projects. I think Steve wanted me to just quickly go over this. So. Um, one of them is water, right? We all talk about water. California now has water futures on the market. Um, it's a big thing. You know, we've got a lot of free water here up here in Washington, but when you're talking about the difference of water rights versus well usage, sharing water, your know, water conservation is going to become a big thing in the future because of climate change. Um, so one of the things we try to do is we worked with uh, two mountain vineyards um, over there in Zilla. And one of the things their challenge was, is, hey, I need to figure out what's going to what block. And I have all these foreign sub mains what's the most cost-effective way to put some water flow metering in there? 
And so we found a solution along with pulse counters that you literally PVC this little saddle onto it with a couple straps. You drill a hole through it once the cement is set about 30 minutes later, you plug in a small little transducer. And for a couple hundred dollars, we're measuring water flow throughout all these vineyards. And so they know what water goes where. Beforehand, it was back of the napkin. I've got X amount of feet of drip line, gallons per minute for emitters. It's really a guesstimate. So now we have real-time flow that to be honest, from whether it's wells or submains, the you know things like the Department of College are going to require down the road. So, just gives us valuable insights on water flow. Next slide. I think it's the last one. Um, and the other one in in ag that we've been doing is uh, it's really around other than bringing soil moisture sensors from different manufacturers in and different weather stations and asset trackers, etc. Based on Lorawan, is we spent a lot of time with our product, which is an air quality sensor. Uh, it has particulates and, and multiple gases. Really, it was around detecting wildfires and the byproducts of combustion. But we've seen uses to where now we want to figure out with, you know, partnership with the universities, what are ag workers being exposed to out there when they're in the middle of harvest? And like last summer, we had a huge amount of smoke in the Yakima Valley. So what can we do from prevention mechanisms, but also... Um, you know, because there is now small uh, air quality um, uh, electrochemical sensors, we can detect things like possibly ethylene and see spoilage of apples out there. And how can we shrink those down into really small sensors um, that you can deploy on a battery to detect something and, and run for five to 10 years. So um, there's a lot of opportunities in sensors. And again, connecting them has really been the challenge we've been trying to work on um, you know, it, and it's not one size that fits all satellites on the horizon, pun intended, and uh, there's a lot of opportunities for growth here. But I think one of the big premises is, you know, with Steve and us and others partnering out there, 5G Innovation Lab, let's really try to, to collectively work together and figure out how we solve these problems, put them in one large repository that's, uh, that's really useful for the growers. That's all I think I got. I like to talk. I'm done. <laughs> I got oh, another turn. <laughs> Woo. Woo. Now I get my wine. Go, oh man, I don't even know how to follow all that up. That's so awesome. Come on, um, you're, the, you're the highlight. That's a you slick go. handoff. That's a slick handoff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, Rob, Tiffany, if I look like death warmed over, I got my second COVID shot yesterday. And so it's the day after. And yeah, I feel like hell. It's great but I wouldn't miss this. I'm here for you. I'm loving all the lower WAN talk. It's good, it's good. Um, I have a lot of friends who are involved in that space for years, so uh, I'm definitely a fan. Uh, so currently, I'm the head of IoT strategy at Ericsson. Uh, if you don't know who Ericsson is, they're a Swedish company that makes cellular gear, hardware, antennas, core networks, all that stuff, and they sell it to mobile operators. Um, it's kind of like Intel inside. You know, I notice a lot of people in the U.S. oftentimes have no idea who Ericsson is. They know who Nokia is because they make phones, right? Ericsson used to make phones a long time ago, but they stopped. Um, and then, of course, some of us lived through having to get really thick skin through the Windows Mobile days at Microsoft uh, and having to do executive briefings and just having arrows shot. At oh boy! And so, so that, that that was brutal. Um, I miss the good old days before they launched the iPhone when it was just us and BlackBerry. That was a lot easier back then. Um, so you can imagine, uh, just from Eric's perspective, you know, obviously, you know, gosh, you can count on one hand, maybe two hands, the companies on the planet that make 5G technology. And so Ericsson's one of the major ones. And that's kind of the big drumbeat. We're rolling out 5G all across the world right now. Um, and, you know, a lot of people talk about 5G, like it's faster, it's lower latency. Um, from my perspective, I think some of the more important aspects of 5G is greater capacity from the same gear. And so what I mean by that is, you know, obviously I've been doing this IoT stuff way too long since the 90s. And you always have these potential bottlenecks with communications technologies, right? And so if it's Wi-Fi, you only get a few dozen people connected to one Wi-Fi router. Um, if it's normal cellular, even today, you know, you walk, you drive by a cell tower, there's only like 1,200 people or more connected to that thing. And then it goes down a tower and there's a backhaul network and all that stuff and fiber and all those kind of things. Um, the great thing about 5G, especially as it relates to, to IoT technology and getting more sensors out there, 
is it's just, I don't know, 100x, 1,000x more capacity. Basically, you can do 1 million concurrently connected devices within a one kilometer range around a cell tower with 5G. That's a huge deal for those of us who are in that space where we want to get a lot of data off a lot of sensors. And a lot of sensors with a lot of individual data points, right? Um, all the, and you know, and all these smart city efforts, you know, you can imagine when we're doing that whole V to X connected car, talking to streetlights, talking to other cars, the whole, it, as it turns out, that wouldn't have worked until we got 5G because it turns out there's not enough capacity in the network. It would have clogged up really fast. Um, so that's really helpful um, from a sustainability standpoint and power usage. Um, it's the same gear, same or less energy usage for you know a million concurrent devices versus maybe a few thousand. So you can kind of do the math there. So it's 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 all good. Um, you know, we do stuff like connection management. Um, I know that sounds random. Um, it, I'd say it's probably more focused on cars than anything else in fleets. You know, if, normally if my, my kind of rule of thumb, um, if it's outside and it's moving around, that's typically when someone thinks about using cellular, right? Because it's got to just roam around, right? And have mobility. Um, and so uh, we, have a, we have a global platform that allows you know, I think it's connected to about 36 mobile operators around the world. But the, the takeaway is if you're making a machine, you're building a car, if you're building a new Toyota or a Volvo, or you're in Shenzhen making a machine and you need to bake in microcontrollers and modules and everything uh, so that that machine is ready to do its thing when it's flipped on, if they're part of that network, it just takes a lot of friction out of it. You know, it's like, could be made in Shenzhen, somebody in France buys it, they turn it on the first time and there's a pipe, right? And they can connect. Just like when you're roaming on your phone, like you're landing in another country and you get the little text message that says, hey, welcome to the Netherlands or whatever, right? And, and so it's, it's kind of like that. Um, on the side, I'm an executive director for a thing called the Moab Foundation, as in like Moab, like Utah, right? You know, where they have all those cool national parks and stuff, right? Um, it's a, I, I still build, I still write tons of code, um, you know, so back at, you know, I was luckily I got to be the co-author of the reference architecture for Azure IoT way back when, when I was working with Steve, uh, at Microsoft and we built and incubated Azure IoT, um, then worked for Hitachi and was kind of, I was the original PM and then ultimately the CTO I designed and the whole Lumata industrial IoT platform to work in factories and on bullet trains and stuff like that. And that's an amazing experience. The key thing though, is just keeping your hands dirty, I think, uh, always. And so on the side though, I've built a kind of an IoT digital twin platform that's really lightweight. Um, and the goal of that, uh, and we can go deep on digital twins if you want to later, Goal of that is to take all this technology we've been using for commercial business uses and see how we can use it to help society better. And so the takeaway for that, you know, what is, I mean, what is IoT? It's remotely knowing something, right? The state of something, the health, the performance, what's its current state? You know, I, I always tell people you're competing against somebody with a clipboard, you know, because you always have to think, what was I doing before IoT was helping me? Well, I was going, driving my truck, getting on a plane, walking around a plant and visiting someplace and taking a reading, right? Looking at a gauge, finding, taking a sample and then putting that down on a clipboard and then maybe typing it into a computer system later back at the ranch, right? That's really all it is. I try to not overthink it. Once you know the state of things, then you can take actions. As Scott was talking about, and Steve, you know, with the frost and things like that. I know this is happening. It's early warning, right? Um, cause you can't be everywhere out on a farm or an orchard. And so the sensors are there to, you know, help augment what a human can do, right? So that you remotely know things quickly. Um, so anyway, built a platform that is ultimately designed to be given away. Um, if anybody are familiar with the United Nations, uh, sustainable development goals, the thinking here, you know, you've got poverty, water issues, hunger, climate, you know, lots of things there. The idea is it turns out there's a lot of use cases where that kind of technology is super helpful in, you know, and we we basically have the, a deadline of 2030, apparently, that we're supposed to have all this stuff fixed. So I'm going to hold my breath on that one. Um, <laughs> but the takeaway is, you know what, 
NGOs, nonprofits, people who are trying to do some good work around the world, guess what? They don't have a lot of cash. And so if it's something I can give to them for free, it's, it's a combination of technology, use cases, what's the, the blueprint, the recipe to execute on that use case, and then ultimately volunteers, right? Um, anyway, I'll wrap it up here. I'm a big fan of Lorwan, even though I work at a cellular company. Uh, I've been friends with uh, Wanky Getzman from the very beginning when he and his partners started Lorwan in the Netherlands. Uh, I dragged a couple of friends from Microsoft to Hitachi to build Lumata, uh, uh, Alistair Fulton and Steve Hegendorfer, and we built Lumata together. And now both of them work at SimTech, which is who makes the, the chipset, the technology that you have to use in order to do Laura. And so uh, definitely plugged in with those guys and definitely a big fan because if there ain't any connectivity, then you're gonna have to make it yourself, right? And so, you know, people can't just sit around and go, well, I'll wait till someone builds a cell tower. You know, that's not gonna happen anytime soon. So good stuff. That's all I got. Start, start <laughs> shooting arrows at me now. There you go. Go, go, Nicely go. done. So normally we have, I don't know if Ian had a chance. Hey, that's my head. Like an open discussion. Is it? Yeah. Hey, that's from last week, isn't it? What oh, is Good your job. head? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. We're, we're on it. Pull it together. So I think, guys, um, just jump on in. I mean, um, one of the things, I, I guess, I mean, you've got to, a couple of experts on here that have background on uh, obviously connecting and, and different types of um, sensors. Also, uh, digital twins. So, Rob, weren't you earlier today on um, some sort of showdown uh, around uh, digital twins? Yeah. Online? Did you survive it? Yes, yesterday Clearly morning. You did. You're here. I, I did. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yesterday morning, it was a digital twin smackdown with two other guys who are a whole lot smarter than I am. Um, but I'm there to be the Forrest Gump of technology to make it accessible to regular people. <laughs> um, but, you know, when you think about digital twin, we're just modeling something. You know, digital twins are something we originated with NASA. There's a professor at back at University of Michigan, it's Michael Greaves, who really started talking about it in the early 2000s. I'd say it's made it's been primarily dominated in the manufacturing industry. You know, it's asset heavy. Right. I'm trying to do a digital model of a physical asset. Right. And all the, the properties of that, you know, um, if it's a car, your car's got an engine and four tires and tire pressure and oil pressure and things like that. Um, and so creating a digital model, IoT is kind of that nervous system that's flowing the telemetry to hydrate. Sorry if you're not an OO programmer, the digital twin <laughs> with the latest state of data. Um, but you know what? It doesn't have to be a car. It doesn't have to be a bullet train or something in a factory. It could be a tree in an orchard. It could be a block. It's the same thing. We're still trying to digitize a thing. The thing might be an organic thing living and it's got properties and it's got health and performance in its current state. And then we can set KPIs and statistics and analytics on that. Um, so I don't think it's terribly different to make the leap from thinking about digital twins in manufacturing to doing it in agriculture. Yeah. What, yeah, do, you, what do you think is the criticality there, guys? And, and audience, welcome to jump in. Um, any of you worked with digital twins or what do you see as the application for the killer use yeah. case for, for digital twins in, in ag? Yeah, certainly. I, you know what? I mean, when, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, I mean, it's, it's, you know, to build a digital twin, you have to have really good data sets for one. Mm -hmm. right? And I mean, it's, if you could plug into a car and create a digital twin of a car, if you don't have the readings, if you don't have a story, if you don't have a current state of everything that's going on, then um, you're limited to what's, you know, on your notepads, literally. <laughs> um, yeah. And so, you, you know, at what point do you take and maybe, and maybe your perspective, Rob, is, is around digital twins, around the collection of useful data to be able to have a digital twin of something, whether it's an organic or inorganic object, and then be able to model changes, right? Because really what you're doing is you're saying, this is not the real thing, but I want to model based on data, programming, algorithms. I want to be able to say what would happen before you actually maybe go execute it with, you know, some yeah. automation down the road, but is... is, is is it better to have a long-term story in the current state of things? Or we had a conversation last week around, 
the difference between a story and the difference between snapshots and point in time of something, what's more meaningful for a digital twin? Yeah. You know what? I like write so many articles about all the components of a digital twin to, cause you're right. You, you know, a lot of times people will mistakenly think that digital twins are AI or something like that. Think of it. If you're an old database person, think of a data definition first. So imagine this, cause there's the digital twin model Let's talk about the car. You know, I have a Ford F-150, it's a 2015, and I'm gonna create a digital twin model of that vehicle. There you go. Nice. And that vehicle's got all those properties, all the things that we got one-to-one sensor values. You know, if you look, you know, especially if you have newer cars, you turn on the car and the dashboard's lit up with so many indicators and so much information like you've never seen before. Well, that's just sensor information. Uh, that actually most cars have had all along. There's just they're just showing it to you, and it's getting really cool looking. IoT is just remotely sending that stuff somewhere else using wireless, right? So the first thing you do is even without needing lots of data, you'll define a digital twin model for that Ford F-150, where you define right front tire. Its unit of measure is pounds per square inch (psi). Mm. Its data type is integer. Um, you do things like that. So you define the vehicle first and then to stick with the OO programming paradigm, your Steve's Ford is an instance of the digital twin and it inherits from all that stuff, right? Because I've seen some miserable IoT platforms where they make these poor suckers have to type in properties for their things a million times for each individual thing instead of doing making it easy because I'm, right. all, I'm all about easy. So you define the model of what it looks like. And and again, don't think about ML. None of this is hard stuff at all. You define the model and then you've got telemetry flying in. So in the past, like without digital twins, data's flying in and it's just landing and usually drop it in a message queue. And then you put it in a database or something like that, right? And it's just a bunch of rows and columns and you write analytics that's going to look at that stuff. Digital twin is just a different way of thinking about modeling the data is all it is. And so now when your telemetry comes flying in from whatever your thing is, you hydrate that, that it comes in and it says, okay, this is data coming from device 975. Well, what the hell is that? Oh, okay. You're, you, cause in my world, the whole thing works. It's, it's APIs, some weird wire protocol, it's twins and then it's bots, it's software agents. So the software agent is looking at the telemetry coming in it sees it's device 75, and then it goes, I'm doing a lookup. This is just like database lookup. I'm walking a tree. I go, oh, I just discovered that device 75 is a moisture sensor uh, you know, in a row of crops. Okay, and its properties, and I walk the tree, its properties are all these things, and there's data labels, and you match it to the data label coming from the actual thing. And then you say, oh, and I expect this to be an integer, and this is what it's all about. The reason you do that is you want to be helpful to your analytics. It, a lot of people just think they're going to throw some kind of advanced analytics or AI or something at this data and magic happens. You and need know to, what big data is? It's, you just kind of throw it all in there and you just throw it all in there and some cool thing. You just shake it up or whatever. Right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. That's AI. I it's AI. AI was Rob. Exactly. So I'm a fan of helping, you know, we, you know, Gosh, if anyone who knows that whole big data and and that space knows that, you know, 70 or 80% of the work is actually called data engineering to try to clean up data because most data is crap. And guess what? Garbage in, garbage out, right? So the twin is a helper. It's defining things. It's the agent of the software is going, oh, that's what this is. That's what this is. And it lets it know what, how to act on it. And then you can actually define and so you'll have telemetry properties that are one-to-one match with sensors. You may have static properties that are it's data that doesn't change very much. My Ford F-150 is 20 feet long. My fuel tank it holds 25 gallons, whatever, things like that. You may have virtual properties back to database stuff. If you ever remember doing calculated columns, there's not a one-to-one matchup with a sensor. Like for instance, when you're driving and you know how you have your miles per hour on your car. There's no such thing as a sensor that tells you that data. It's actually a combination. It's a calculation from a a number of things to tell you how many miles per hour you're going. So you could think of that as a virtual property. 
then you then you can put KPIs on these things for every property. Let's just focus on the, the left front tire. You can do KPIs that say, what do I expect? What's the good value? And I know you guys are doing this anyway. What's the good value? Oh, 32 PSI is where I want to be. So, you know, we all done KPIs a million years ago, green, yellow, red, right? So you can define what's green, what's yellow, what's red. And so that agent can look at there, says, what's the actual value? Oh, it's, it's 39. Wow, that's in the red zone. What do I do next? And this can get you into prescriptive analytics where you can put in as far as, and this is, this is basically me putting more of the load of work into the twin than you writing tons of code of analytics code. It's like, let the twin tell you what to do and be your guide and that kind of thing. Um, anyway, I'm kind of rambling here, but uh, <laughs> you know what? It, it, it's good context. It's, it's, people it's, can wrap their important. heads around it. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. it's important because, you know, all too often we see this in, in just IoT in general, when we're getting out there and, you know, in the context of agriculture, you know, garbage in, garbage out, um, you know, we see too often is, you know, you, you ask a grower, it says, well, what, what, what IOT do you have? Oh, I have this crazy solution I bought and I've got 52 different apps on my phone and you drive around during harvest season and they still have 52 sticky notes sitting inside their, their truck. <laughs> well, I always said in, you know, a friend told me, it says, if it's a sticky note inside of a truck, that's an opportunity yes. to really optimize it with the right data, but that having the model to it, otherwise, you know, Steve and I had a conversation of this. I think it was at the um, the, the launch of the Smart Ag uh, or Smart uh, Orchard last week, when we were in that that picture, the roundtable discussion around data ownership. Right? If you're creating data because some company gives you a sensor and an application on your phone, and that company goes out of business, do you own that data? Mm. Yeah, that's a tough one. You know, there's the whole world of orphaned IoT devices out there in the consumer space. <laughs> um, back in because it's come into from over, you know, 32 different manufacturers of stuff who want to do it in their own silo, to be honest. Um, right. I think right. the interesting is to, to figure out how, you know, Steve on the Innovate Ag platform and working with researchers and working collectively here, how we can try to kind of unify that in a way to where you know, maybe we apply a digital twin model to all this data, kind of normalize the data coming in from all these different manufacturers into yeah. something that's modeled and useful. Absolutely. And then there's this other notion that's going to sound a whole lot like a, like a Russian doll kind of thing. Um, and, I'll, and I apologize, I'll use another manufacturing example instead of agriculture. I'm sorry. Um, you've got a machine and it, it, you, you have a, a robot that's on the assembly line, right? And it's building a car. Um, Sometimes it has a subsystem that's so complex, it deserves to have its own digital twin in the subsystem. And so, you know, or the car, the car's engine is a pretty complex with a whole lot of stuff on its own. And so the car is a digital twin, the parent and the engine might be a parent child relationship. And its properties can have causal relationships to bubble up to the whole car. Kind of like when you go to the shop and the guy goes, I don't know, I think you got another 10,000 miles and the thing's gonna die or whatever. Digital twins can help you map those relationships. And then you can go bigger than that. Things that sound like a group, you can say, oh, I've got, um, and everybody looks frozen. You got to hate it when everybody's frozen. Um, you got, <laughs> things that look like a group doesn't have to be just a static group. A whole bunch of you know, industrial robots come together and they make something we call an assembly line. But that assembly line, a group, can be a twin itself with its own properties. And so causal relationships and property mapping can bubble up to that assembly line. And you can imagine just going from there, a bunch of assembly lines turns into a factory, right? And, and throw digital twins and the flow through these causal relationships with properties, you all of a sudden see a living organism kind of, right? And you can absolutely do that, you know, in an orchard, right? You know, what's the vigor of the tree? What's the block look like? You know, you can you can pull all that together to try to get a larger and larger view of the whole thing using this way of looking at it. Makes sense. Hey, I'm seeing a handful of questions going to pop in here. If you guys have a chance to look at the chat as well, um, and I'm fighting uh, AT and T not working so well out here in in uh, 
no point the docs. Um, but one of them was around um, digital twins and opening up to predictive twins, yeah. I think, if I can get to that page. You know, I just think of you're not doing whatever it is you're doing. If it's simple, if this and that stuff, all the way out to, to ML models, obviously you're not doing it against the physical anything. And so, you know, step one is make that twin of the thing. And then everything you're doing is acting on the twin, right? Um, and so whether it's, and remember over time, you know, you're doing time series. So you have the latest state. And so what's the current twin of the thing that you care about? And then the historical state of the twins going back in time, you may have heard a term called digital thread. The thread is that historical state. You know, if you think about building a, a machine or something, it's from birth to death, the whole life cycle of that thing is captured, you know? Um, and so, but anyway, whatever the analytics are, and if it is predictive stuff, you're just, you're just applying it to the twin itself. And the historical state of the twin is going to give you some of that information you need to find that needle in the haystack, right? And go beyond just kind of reactive early warning to, you know, being able to look around the corner. Yeah, I think the history, the history part is the key part of that. Yeah, totally. Totally. Uh, there, was a, there was a question about LTE needed for JPEG images, camera traps. Um, I'll grab this one. I think it's uh, pretty timely. Steve and I were talking about this literally, I think it was last night or the night before around how do we get um, a lot of training data from imagery, right? Obviously, Innovate Egg's been driving green around gathering terabits of data from, from orchards. Uh, but how do we take that data and, and really get it to the cloud? And it's a, it is a challenge. I think, you know, the, the platform that I've been talking about is all around connectivity is difficult and it completely depends on where you're at. Some places will have LTE coverage that's good enough to take a LTE uh, enabled Wi-Fi trap, um, or I mean a Wi-Fi camera trap, um, or you might use Wi-Fi if you've got a hotspot there. You might have to use to satellite. Um, one of the things we're trying to look at from a from a how do you create smaller sensors to take training data that you might already have. For example, we're going to take some camera traps. Steve and I are going to deploy them next week out there and look them at look at the blossom. To, to the Apple and, and historically a couple times a day, let's take some snapshots. That might be completely offline that we're gathering that training data. We'll go train it in the cloud. There's some new products out on the edge that don't think about it as constantly streaming data in a very sparsely connected region, right? If you don't have LTE or really poor connectivity. So how about you take things offline, take it to the cloud, do a bunch of machine learning on it, process that training data and then you're seeing new products out there. Um, this is their Arduino Portenta. Uh, Rob, you've probably seen this. It was a big announcement earlier, that actually late last year, but they actually released a LoRaWAN radio. Now LoRaWAN is bits per second, not megabytes per second. Right. And what you can do is you take the training data with TinyML, inference that training onto this device, and then say, you know what? I've captured an algorithm that this little tiny little camera can then look statically, maybe at the blossom as it grows all the way into fruit. And with a high level of probability based on your training data, I only need to send a message that says this. I yeah. hit bud break, I hit bloom, I hit maturity and color and vigor of this apple. Only transmit that data, which gets sent over a single packet 24 miles away. You're also saving battery life. You don't have to go out there and put large solar panels, et cetera. So there's, I think there's a trade-off and there's an opportunity to do both. There's yeah. a need to capture data more streaming in real time, but then there's also this, how do we take that useful data and not just garbage in, garbage out, throw it in a data set somewhere. Let's train it and make it useful with smaller and more cost-efficient devices that let's say an orchard can then say, hey, for a hundred dollars, I'll go deploy a dozen of these out in the field and really try to get actionable insights about what the state is I think, Rob, to your point, otherwise you're constantly having to manually drive out there. And if you're not there, you're not going to see it. Right. Absolutely. You're constantly putting things on a notepad. Um, how can you yeah. create some of these insights and this data collected over whatever medium to then, you know, be able to you know, process it in a different way and create a different set of sensors? So this is kind of the transition we're seeing as well. Absolutely. On the side. Yeah. Tiny emails, cool stuff. And, you know, just something to piss off all the cloud people, even though I was involved in that. 
the cl there's no connection between the cloud and IoT. I know a lot of cloud hyperscale players try to create the illusion through marketing that it was an essential ingredient. If you can do the stuff with tiny compute or edge compute nearby, just do that. There's, there's no rule that says you have to send something back to a distant cloud, especially if you've got constrained connectivity and things like that. You might have all the horsepower you need. I mean, it's just another server, right? Um, and so whether it's your Arduino, whether it's some kind of just incrementally larger edge compute kind of device that's talking to a bunch of things or something in the packing house, you know, it, it's the compute is compute. Analytics is analytics. Uh, and so, because a lot of times people struggle, they go, God, I, I'm able to daisy chain from this part to this part and got back, but I can't get all the way to, you know, AWS IoT core. And I'm like, don't sweat it. Don't sweat it. All those capabilities you're, can, can be on-prem if that's what you need, you know? Correct, correct. Flexibility is so important. And I don't want people to feel like they're pigeonholed into some kind of paradigm. I think that kind of leads into one other question. There's a question up here from Philip. Uh, stable and robust hardware and tech is good and interesting. However, any examples of data that converts all the monitoring into actual farming information, data displays, GUI examples, et cetera. Steve, this is kind of where I think you come in and what you guys have been doing in Innovate Ag and really taking the different technologies. We're gathering sensor data, a lot tied with research, but then, you know, where is the what is traditionally an application built by a sensor developer in a silo, and there's tons of them that they have, bringing that data together to where, you know, reduce it down to actionable insights and data dashboards in what mm -hmm. you guys are trying to do. Yeah, I, I would agree. I mean, it's it's um, it's about data visualization, also, right? So key, this digital twin bit is, is really key on getting the data so that it actually is, is repeatedly kind of organized and you've got a nice clean data pipeline and, and there's less pain that goes into it. Um, but then the other key that we found along the journey, and, and it is a journey, we're still figuring out um, the approach, but is when I was at Microsoft, it was all about the dashboards. We just lived and breathed by dashboards to the point that it was excruciatingly painful sometimes. But um, you, you know, you've got key performance indicators, targets that you have for different um, things, and you're, you're visualizing that data and, uh, you know, are you meeting or achieving and what's the supporting data that go uh, to those, those KPIs. Um, but what I found in, in talking to growers, for the most part, you got to meet them where they are. And what all growers can relate to is maps, maps and equipment. And, um, and so that's why our focus predominantly is you layer it onto a map, use as few words as possible. You've got people that, that um, may not even have a high school education and you've got PhDs, but all of us can actually be on the same wavelength. If we're looking at a map, we can understand context to the map and go from there. Um, and so um, it, it's about visualizing the data. And we believe also in layers and show the relatability of layers so that it all ultimately ties in um, together, that's that's the name of the game, and uh, and then really monitoring the telemetry from the telemetry, e.g., looking at the usability data of how people are actually interacting with that data that you visualized, um, and and context is another key piece. So, is a spray operator going to care about um, you know the context on? Um, I don't know, I'm trying to think for a second, um, something that might not be as relevant for them. Um, the schedule for thinning labor. Well, probably not because they're not even there in there at the same time. So pulling out the layers that aren't relevant. Otherwise you just make, you've got this application that's just painful for the users and viewers of that data um, to understand. And then finally, I think closing in the feedback loop as to, well, not are only how are they using it, but, you know, what are they doing with it? And almost think of it as kind of Amazon ratings, like how useful is this data to what they're doing um, and then tweaking from there. That's, that's ultimately what um, our approach is and what we're encouraging um, others in the industry. And certainly, yeah, welcome you guys' feedback as to how you're doing that today and, and how you see that as relevant or perhaps off base. 
you know, uh, go ahead. My little tagline or whatever on IoT was just, you know, connect, collect, analyze, act, right? Just keep it simple. You know, ultimately, and here's the other thing, you know, and it's not necessarily about a, a twin thing, but, you know, you talked about creating context. Um, when you're just getting machine data from something, it may not be as useful unless you're doing data blending. You know, I need to pull data from other sources, weather data. I might need to talk to a customer's backend business system, their databases, whatever, to pull that together to create better context for what this thing is all about. You know, if it's some machine that has an SLA, well, I know that from pulling it from SAP. And then, and then I know the actual data from the machine. And then I know a few other things. You might remember a long time ago in the earlier days of like web services, people started talking about doing mashups. Um, it's basically that. It's basically that you're doing a mashup. And so the machine data, the sensor data by itself, sometimes that's all you need, but sometimes you need to blend it with other things. And you can blend that into the twin if you want to, to have a better picture of what's going on. And then as Steve said, though, sometimes it's not relevant. And the whole part of the, the bigger part of at least this is just a paradigm to organize things for you is you're right, there's a whole lot going on on the farm besides just knowing the state of sensor data. There's labor, there's people coming and going, there's inputs, there's outputs, you know, you can tie all that stuff in. It's just like when I'm doing the factory thing, part of the factory thing, once you've got a living factory is you've also got raw material inputs coming into the factory to be turned into a machine. And then you have supply chain going out the other door all that stuff is modeled because it's all important, right? It's all about money and, and time and labor and things like that. And so uh, you can absolutely go nuts with that. Um, the last thing I'll say is, you know, you're pointing at the twin to show a dashboard, to do analytics, you know, because that's where the data is, right? The ultimate extension of IoT you know, we talk about trillions of devices or something like that. And I know that seems crazy because IoT is really underperformed in a big way. Um, ultimately, we will go beyond dashboards and things like that. You know, if in order to really have that promise of tens of millions of devices doing things and twins hydrating and bots knowing what to do, it all has to be fully automated at some point. It just depends on the business you're in. It may not be appropriate for agriculture, but it might be appropriate for giant factories or shipping containers and stuff like going in ports. At some point, the whole system has to be alive and it's got to make decisions on its own without a human always looking at a dashboard saying, oh, okay, I think we should do this. I think it just depends on the use case. Um, but that's, and so those, if you, uh, you know, another old e term from databases, ETL, <laughs> you know, we move data around from one database to another. Um, the, the notion of, let's say I've got telemetry coming in from an industrial robot and it's hydrating the twin and I'm doing analytics and I'm doing some ML and I determine that that machine's gonna fail next Thursday. And you always talk about, I gotta fix it before it fails, right? Well, in a perfect world, that message would flow either through an API or some ETL stuff right into maybe ServiceNow or some other system to create a trouble ticket to have someone go fix that thing in off time. Well, this is the same thing with agriculture. It's the act part. And so I figure stuff out. I know it's getting, the frost is coming. What do I need? To, who do, do I need to alert someone? Do I need to activate a windmill or something? What do I need to do? Um, you know, I know it sounds like automation and robots taking over the planet. So, you know, your mileage will vary. Well, and I think there's a, you know, it's interesting. There's, I still, I'll see folks around AI and machine learning and it gets all bundled together in one big thing, but you'll see companies that are startup and ag tech and they're, they jump in. So take irrigation, for example, right? You don't see the big irrigation companies kind of really doing it yet, but you see all these startups are like, Hey, we're going to automate everything from irrigation. But I'll tell you what, until you have basic data around where your water goes and what are kind of the, the challenge points around, okay, I've got a break in the line because a coyote decided to chew on the, the drip irrigation line or a rat decided to eat through the cable that powered the valve. <laughs> until you actually build trust and credibility in the data that you have there and how your system's operating, there's no point in going full rotation into full automation because 
we've seen too many companies actually, especially in the irrigation space, fail because of that. Yeah. So I think there's this kind of crawl, walk, run phase that, you know, if we can if we can learn and gather insights and build models, and then eventually the ultimate goal is to act. But I think we have to be careful. Um, yeah. You know, someone says right here, yeah, it takes a community to make a better farm. And I think collectively, how do we make sure we get the right sets of data, the right sets of connectivity for a million different use cases? Because it's different than, you know, commodity and permanent crops um, right. and, 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 and us working together on things. And whether that's, you know, building a platform that we can all collaborate on, make it open, uh, break down data silos. I think there's, there, there's, a, there's a challenge out there, but we, we got to be prevent not over rotating to the full AI automation side. Totally. You, you gloss over everyone else in the process. Absolutely. You know, because I used to drive submarines in a former life. And I remember way back when, when the Soviets built the fully automated subs, like you're flying the Starship Enterprise, and it didn't work out for them at all. It turns out having people walking around and taking logs and stuff like that and lots of eyeballs, almost like pair programming, turned out to be safer. There's your random submarine quote for the day. Anyway. <laughs> Said the guy that's from the submarine. <laughs> yes. Yeah, exactly. No, because, you know, full automation, well, right? You have to trust but verify. Or these sensors, who's watching the watchmen, right? Yeah. There's a, so there's a lot of questions in here. It's hard to sift through them all, Steve. I don't know how you want to take this because I think we'll probably run out of time. You know, there's stuff around hardware and um, software and data dashboards. Uh, maybe some of these we key up for another one. But, um, you know, there's there was a question I think Michael had yeah, that I, I can answer real quickly around hardware. It's like, you know, go ahead. There's, there's a lot of stuff in IoT that you can tinker with and play around with. And I got this notion because we build stuff and then we're also an integrator. So we look on both sides of the wheel and we go, hey, is it cost effective to go build it yourself? Hack it yourself in your garage. I'm literally sitting in my garage. I got lots and lots of Arduinos and ESP32s and all that stuff. But when it comes to connectivity, if there's someone in the area, so like LoRaWAN, you know, it's not like Europe where it's ubiquitous. It's everywhere, right? Vink and those guys and the TTN, they build a great little platform and, and the Semtech guys have really created a an ecosystem, both on the sensor side and the network side. Um, here in the States, if there's, you know, the more we can partner on research and agriculture, and if I'm building connectivity, like across the state of Washington, then yeah, let's, let's use my network and don't waste your time on building your own open source gateway. There are plenty of commercial options out there. Same thing I look at with sensors. If there's something that's needed, we'll go build it. But if there's already a commercial, you know, anyone could build a temp pressure humidity sensor, but hey, these guys out of Europe, a sense stick that runs on two AAA batteries for 10 years and transmits really, really good data. You know what, it's a hundred bucks. That's awesome. We now have in canopy microclimates. It doesn't require a solar panel or a cellular radio. I could put thousands of these out in the field for frost detection. So if the, if something's already commercially out there, when you look at the sensor ecosystems, use that as much as possible and then focus your time on good connectivity solve, getting really good data out of these sensors and applying those that are something that's useful. Right. Yeah. Good advice for sure. What else do we got in here? Lots of plugs. Um, Lots of plugs. Know, you, see any, you see anything else, Steve or Ian? Steve, you I there? mean, if um, anybody's questions didn't get answered or you feel like you have a question, you can unmute yourself and ask away, honestly. Yeah, if we, we accidentally overlooked it because so many were coming on all at once. A lot of good yeah. questions in there. Yeah. So and comments. Kind of, I, and I, I could stay on a little longer too. If you guys, if you guys want, I've got time. So. Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah, let's do away. this. Let's, let's do a little bit of a, let's do a little wrap. I think, um, I think the key thing, Ian, help me out here is he had polls, but that was really more for the outset. Um, is um, what would you guys like to cover in, in future meetups? I don't know if Dan Maycock's on here today, but he said, Steve, you know, um, COVID's, COVID's slowing down. Um, both my kids just got pulled out of uh, their school shut down in the last two days. So I don't know if it's really slowing down, but, um, you know, 
meetups don't all have to need, need to be virtual. Um, some of it is just doing, um, you know, small group things and so on. And so open to format, um, really want to avoid this being an infomercial. Hopefully it's not coming across that way. Um, we just want to basically, you know, host a venue, bring folks together. Actually, I love some of these conversations in here around farm OS and, um, you know, Swan, um, some of the different things. The intent here really is to bring together a combo of, of technologists, um, growers that, that um, are dabbling in tech or deep into tech. Um, and I think that's my one piece that I want to try to bring more growers into this conversation. And, and that's the, the balance is trying to find the blend on, um, you know, talking at, at from, a, from an ag level, their, their level. And that's, I think really a critical piece we as technologists all need to really rally around is making sure that it's really highly relevant and applicable um, to them. So good combo uh, here today. I guess the question for folk, feel free to just kind of pop in the window is you know, what would you, as we do this next month, what would you like to hear more about? Is it, is it delving into more specific scenarios? Um, your know, automation is not something that we've yet delved into in, in the meetup type scenario. Um, is it, we could do a, a deeper dive on, on one of the smart orchards if, if you would like. Generally, this ag tech meetup is more, is primarily focused around permanent crops um, rather than just all ag because there's just, uh, we can't boil the ocean too far. Um, got thoughts, comments, suggestions? Um, Fireworks or, or uh, bombs you want to throw um, Scott's way or Rob's way, not my way. <laughs> <laughs> Always someone unmute themselves. Yeah. Let's get a little lonely okay. here. <laughs> really hoping someone throws a grenade over the wall at us. <laughs> right, right. Exactly. Yeah. Back down. Got to make this yeah. interesting, right? We got to stir the pot. Exactly. Right, Right. Well, you know, a couple times ago, Rob, you missed the one where it was like 5G versus LoRaWAN versus SpaceX uh, Starlink. That was fun. Oh, I bet. It was like, I hate you guys. But you know what? You know, the that, other part of that is that connectivity. But, you know, like everything in IoT, whatever the industry, it comes down to cost, too. And so, you know, yeah. the mobile That's operators. True. And availability. Yeah, charging you too much to get data from a weather station that – it costs so much that it's not worth doing. That's kind of a problem. And that still happens today. You know, there's a whole lot of reasons why IoT has underperformed every analyst's expectations. And while IoT really launched and really got going in a big way, maybe back in 2010, you know, when ThingWorks and stuff like that came out, um, it, it, it's still, you know, you have a perfect storm, you know, lower cost microcontrollers, sensors, semi ubiquitous networks depending on where you are capturing data is a no brainer storage especially in the clouds like going to zero and then analytics which used to be the domain of governments or giant companies well gosh you just go to apache.org and just download whatever you want for free it's things like that that have made that have democratized this space uh, obviously, you still have to know how to use those tools, <laughs> but it, but at least there's not some giant cost anymore, and so it's more accessible. Um, but when you put all those things together, and it's great to do stuff in the lab, and then when you deploy ten thousand things out there, and all of a sudden it's like, oh wow, it got really expensive. Um, yeah. You know, oh they're trying to charge me for an iPhone plan for just a stupid sensor. What what's going on? So um, I think that's yeah. why we all have to work together. You know, agree. and and call BS on systems that just don't make sense. Because in the end, if it costs too much to be worth doing, then what's what's it all about, right? Right. No, it's true. There's, a, there's know, an I, interesting question, really quick. I just want to answer really, really quickly because it's go. a part of this is a digital twin. It's right. I think it was. Uh, are we going to build a digital twin of the farmer's knowledge of his farm? And I think that's where that kind of story comes in. I think you know, are we going to be able to digitize everything that was in your mind over the past 50 years? Maybe, maybe not. That might take some time. Someone's going to come up with some technology to scan a bunch of, you know, yellow, stick, little yellow sticky pads. Um, but I think, you know, like what I'm starting to see in irrigation is we can create that by passively monitoring things like the irrigation system 
because someone is still going out in there and turning valves on and off on their ATV by hand X amount of times a day as a part of their irrigation plan. They might not have everything fully automated. But at that same time, if we can gather those insights, you're building a digital story of the human interaction of that system. And I think if we think of it that way, you're passively gathering data that is useful down the road. And now uh, Steve is now in his ATV and I think he's gonna drive around. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. You know, the digital twin of the farmer's knowledge is not that far out there. Um, I've certainly worked on and written some papers that sound really freaking dystopian about digital twins of just employees at companies where, you know, like in the same way that I often will tell, I like to use a car as an example for a digital twin because it's something everybody understands. And a lot of times I might, you know, you might say, well, open your glove compartment and pull out the owner's manual. That's the digital twin of your vehicle. Well, with people, likewise, you can imagine the, the, the employee manual, right? Or what's your role? And so when I talk about a digital twin model being defining, you can imagine using a digital twin to define an employee working in a cubicle or a farmer with lots of knowledge and it's got properties and it's got history and you can start packing that stuff in there and how that farmer interacts with other people or machines or customers. You can imagine those turning into APIs, right? <laughs> and then software agents bring it to life. So, you know, we had to make things a little weird and dystopian today. But Guys, I, I need a jam. Um, Feel free to stay on if anybody wants to kind of continue on the conversation. Um, this has been good. I think another food for thought uh, for us is for future meetups is uh, is tools, geospatial tools, that type of thing. And if there's interest in that, certainly put a note in um, and we'll look to bring that at a future meetup as well. Thanks everyone for joining. Thanks very much to our hosts um, or experts, I should say.